Okay, thank you for having the opportunity uh, for me to be able to speak with you. This is a conversation today to um, be able to help to support the members of the Chicago Dental Society. And it gives you a chance, you know, as, a, as an opportunity, we're all in very un, unusual, uncharted waters uh, for many of us. Um, and this is an opportunity to hear from the leadership of the, the CDS and to hear what your thoughts are. And as we have this relatively brief conversation, you know, if you ask me any questions, I can try to answer too. It's a bridge between the practice community and education. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. Well, good morning, Dean Stanford. And I, I really appreciate uh, having this opportunity to, to have this discussion with you and the time to just chat. And um, this has been an interesting time for all of us. I use the word interesting uh, lightly. It's, <laughs> I could use a lot of different words, but it's, it's been a challenging time. And uh, I think I welcome this opportunity to have this discussion with you. And I thank you. Sure. In times of um, unusual issues, it's always good that communication, there's an old joke in leadership that you can never over communicate. Um, and sometimes we're communicating in a little bit of the fog of war and we don't know exactly where we're heading, but I think it's very helpful for especially members to understand what are the thoughts that are going through the leadership and what the leadership is considering. So I thought uh, maybe we could start here as to if you could give me any sort of thoughts of what the CDS board is thinking about through this, and especially the fact that CDS really represents the best in terms of continuing education. What has the, been the board's thoughts around this new world about either you know, the large meetings and the future of large meetings and the value those have, because they are incredibly important for networking and being able to bridge that professionalism between us and to share uh, information but how is that going to bridge to with the advent of so much online learning uh, that's going on in the CE space now? Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I couldn't agree more. I think at a time like this, communication is vitally important. And we're all communicating a little bit differently right now. Uh, all of our meetings have been held by Zoom. The CDS board has been meeting via Zoom like everyone else. And I want to first say that we have been trying to communicate to our members. When this all started initially, uh, we reached out to them just to try and offer words of comfort to hang in there. Um, we reached out to our members right at the beginning of this pandemic and our members stepped up. I'm very proud to say our members stepped up with their donations of PPE right at the beginning of this fight. And so I did wanna mention that uh, through this new form of communication, we were able to pull together and, and have, have our members really step up. But as far as uh, to your point of continuing education, we are definitely looking into that as we see that um, the future of large meetings, like our midwinter meeting, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So this Thursday, we are uh, sponsoring a webinar uh, specifically for Illinois residents on the COVID-19, um, how it's affecting the business aspect of their practices. So right off the bat, we are uh, offering that on Wednesday, uh, on this Thursday, rather, the 30th at two o'clock, and people can sign up on our website, cds.org. But going forward, uh, our regional meetings that we hold, uh, you know, our large gatherings, and they're very important to our members to get CE. So we are uh, in discussions at the beginning of our discussions about the future of those and whether we will have to hold those via a Zoom type format. As far as large gatherings like our midwinter meeting, um, we are just beginning to wrap our heads around uh, what the future may hold for a meeting like that as I'm sure you know most of the large dental meetings for the rest of the year were canceled. We were very blessed to have been able to hold ours. Uh, but what the future holds, we don't know right now, but we are starting to think about what these meetings might look like and it's possibly going to be a different, a different uh, venue. 
different well, venture. Well, you have me on your program for 21, so maybe I need to start thinking about my lecture <laughs> a little bit different. <laughs> well, maybe not quite yet, but perhaps in the back of your mind, you might need to, um, you know, to start thinking about it. I think that everyone's going to have to start considering this, uh, given, given the present. But I think um, it's certainly something we can't ignore. Uh, but nothing specific yet, but we're certainly looking into options for continuing education uh, without uh, having meeting face-to-face -face in large group settings. Yes. So I do want to give you a shout out if you haven't seen it. The ADA News that just came out this week has a very nice article about how much uh, CDS has done to stand up to help uh, the Illinois Medical District. And as you said, uh, the significant contribution of the CDS members for helping uh, our frontline medical providers, um, and they've been very, very appreciative. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity for dentistry to be able to be a part of supporting the frontline workers. And we actually have some of our dentists um, actually doing the uh, testing swabs right now. So mm, kind, very of, good. kind of different. <laughs> very good. Um, so I'm curious, what have you been hearing from members right now? Yes, so it has been a roller coaster ride a little bit, you know, um, what I've been hearing from members mostly over the last week there, you know, there's been a little bit, it's been a little bit of confusion, uh, some mixed messages, people, of course, want to get back to work. On the other hand, uh, there are all the questions about what, what are we to do when we get back to work. Uh, there have been some uh, mixed messages coming out of the governor's office. Uh, a few days ago, we were told that we could have been working all the time. Uh, then yesterday, that was changed back to emergencies only. Uh, so members are a little bit confused, some to a certain extent. Uh, I, I do want to say that yesterday, there was an interim guide that came out from the ADA that I think was a very helpful tool. Mm -hmm that um, you know, I will steer our members to uh, as far as answering some questions about what to look towards when we return. But the biggest concern I think for our members, the questions that I've been getting is, are we allowed to be working yet? Uh, are we allowed to be using our high speed hand pieces? Um, people there, we've gotten so many sort of different messages and, and, and people, um, the members are a little bit, a little bit confused and concerned. And also the other thing is the um, procurement of the PPE. That's the next thing, because once we do get back to work, uh, will we have enough of the PPE that we need uh, to keep our patients safe, ourselves safe, our staff? So that, that's the other big issue. Yeah, you touched on some, some, big mega issues. I have been in communication with some of the, the large vendors, especially 3M, as to what their projection of the supply line is for the PPE that dentistry would need and been in discussion with the governor as to uh, what would be needed for releasing that right now under the federal act that's in play uh, by President Trump. The Many of the inventory for personal protective equipment is under, basically is under federal edict right now. So until the, the federal government backs off, the vendors are actually saying they actually have quite a large volume of PPE and are actually indicating that based on the supply chain, the, they, they feel that by midsummer, uh, they, there will be plenty of PPE. And in fact, we think can get past some of this hoarding like toilet paper like activities that have been going on in some parts of the marketplace with uh, basically exorbitant uh, charges and classic supply and demand. But the vendor, the major vendors are, are saying that the supply chain is getting better. It's going to just take some time. Um, but that's, that's very, they're very good much, news. They're very much uh, very interested in helping and they recognize um, specifically uh, based on the OSHA uh, statement from late March, which dentistry was placed um, at high risk because of the aerosolization that uh, we inherently generate by ultrasonic and uh, high-speed handpiece. Um, but 
the 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 vendors are re recognizing it and they're working very hard to to help engineer solutions. Um, some actually, I'm working with a College of Engineering faculty here whose research area is in aerosols and viral transmission. So it's been very opportune for the conversations for them to understand uh, what we deal with in dentistry, and they're coming up very rapidly with some very creative solutions. So. In a time of crisis, you can come up with some really cool ideas that um, can get us back to playing the game that we all love to play. Well, there is always a bright side to every, every story. And it's good news to hear what you're saying about the supply chain. My only concern about that is you mentioned midsummer. And so again, it brings up some concerns for those that are looking to getting back to work at the end of May, perhaps, or you know, beginning of June. So I think these are still some issues that need to be worked out. Sure. Um, you well, know, part of it me. is the um, um, when the federal government uh, in, in put into place the War Production Act uh, from 1950, that act actually locked down inventory. So even though there was inventory that could be shipped it's now under the, product, the War Production um, Act. So that's where some of the vendors saying, as soon as that act is lifted, they would be able to provide uh, a, a rapid flow into the supply chain of uh, authentic uh, PPE. As you know, the market's being flooded right now by non, well, let's just say, call it cloned uh, items that look real but aren't. So that's the concern right now. And 3M is extremely concerned about their reputation. So they're very sensitive about it. Right. Um, the other thing um, that I just want to talk about is your thoughts around the CARES Act. Now, we went through what I call phase one of the Small Business Administration two loan programs. They ran on money. Uh, just in the news this morning, uh, we started in round two yesterday, I think. Um, what have been the observations from the members over trying to get support from uh, the two programs? Yes, so the members that I've spoken to about, about that, many were having trouble. Uh, with the first round, they were having trouble uh, receiving funds. Um, with the second round, I'm hopeful that they will have better access. I know there are more uh, uh, banks and uh, entities stepping up offering access to these funds rather than the huge banks. You know, I think that was part of the problem. And so I saw today, there are some other avenues that you can take to receive the PPP loans. So I'm hopeful that uh, our members that were not able to get funds through the loan the first time will be able to get, um, have access now. As far as the, um, the idle grants uh, and those loans, also, it's been split. Some of our members have been able to get that first advance based on the number of their employees. There are others who have not received that money yet. So I'm not sure if that was based on how quickly they applied. I, I really don't know. And so some, some have gotten that money. But as far as the PPP loans, a lot of people are still waiting and we're not able to get in on that first round. I did see this morning also a few more of the large entities that received uh, millions of dollars that didn't necessarily need it um, are giving back. And so I hope that that trickles down to help our members who were not able to get those loans yet um, to procure the money that they need. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, is CDS doing anything to help members in guiding through a very complex situation of trying to apply for these loans and or is there, where do you see a role there for CDS to help um, just give information to the members on this? Well, yes, and that's exactly, well, first of all, we've been very um, forthcoming with sending out any information that we've gotten uh, to all of our members on, uh, via email or on our, uh, you know, social networking um, devices, you know, Facebook and such. So we've gotten any information that we, have, we've made available to our members. But that's exactly why we are hosting the webinar on Thursday. We wanted something specific to Illinois. You know, we've been inundated with webinars, um, which is fine, but we wanted to, to provide something specific for our members in Illinois. 
and um, so the Chicago Dental Society decided to host this webinar specifically on HR issues, on business issues, on the PPP loans. So again, I already mentioned, but if you have not signed up, we do have a limit, but we still have spaces available. And I would urge people to sign up for this webinar. It is a question and answer format, and the host is asked for specific questions that they will address during this webinar on Thursday at two o'clock. And so uh, that is exactly uh, why we are hosting, uh, hosting this to help our members uh, with, with these issues. Excellent, excellent. Thank yeah. you for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Do you have any questions for me? I do. Uh, one of the, when you ask uh, some of the concerns that our members uh, have, one of the uh, recent sources of confusion have been, um, you know, there was a, a mandate uh, sent about a week or 10 days ago from the Illinois Department of Public Health regarding uh, the fact that dentists were not to be using high-speed handpieces. Um, and then we, as we discussed at the beginning, you know, then we got some mixed messages from the governor. Uh, but now we, I would like some clarification so that I can give our members from IDPH regarding what they said about the use of high-speed handpieces and um, where we stand with that right now. So um, we should be getting some guidance released um, either today or in the, in the very near future. It's working through the standard processes of IDPH, but uh, there has been a lot of communication with the governor's office. The idea in concept is when we looked at the ADA toolkit that came out yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, I would say in terms of the conversation is now emulating very closely the same kind of recommendations of staged reentry. Um, I like to refer to this uh, pandemic as like landing an airplane in a thunderstorm. We're gonna have ups and down drafts. We're going to have times when it's calm and then it's gonna get really violent. Um, and it's, a, you know, if you ever landed in an airplane, you, you just, you know, you're praying to the God of you want. And uh, when you hit the ground, uh, you thank him or her. And uh, it was one of those things where I see right now that what they're trying to do the, the, is to risk looking at the various procedures we do as dentists and then looking at uh, the risk profiling of that, looking at the kind of level of either environmental controls that may be needed or what we refer to as the administrative controls in a dental school administrative controls would be for instance the standardized um, infection control procedures we have and the standardized infection control training we do with uh, faculty and staff and students um, it's the same thing as in your private office where you would have your standard operating procedures uh, making sure the the cleaning equipment is there making sure that um, as with the ADA uh, toolbox yesterday, it came out things, things like getting rid of those 20 year old magazines that used to be sitting yeah, right. in the reception room. You know, all We've all those. wanted a reason to get rid of those anyway. <laughs> yeah, now they're gone. Uh, Reader's <laughs> Digest won't be the same, but uh, the, so it's one of those things that is changing. And I think one of the most important things here is we need to make sure our patients have the confidence that us as uh, dental care providers are having their best interests in mind, which every member does, I'm sure, but we need to show that so that they trust being able to come back and trust to be able to be in our practices, feeling comfortable knowing that we are doing the very best. You know, we have a lot of patients here who are, are calling us daily going through all of the issues with emergencies um, and we have to do that same standard process of triaging. I have excellent faculty who are actually triaging, doing teledentistry, assessing, is it a, um, an emergency? Is it an urgency? Or is it simply a time sensitive issue and we need to stabilize that, that situation? Um, and then all the way to elective. Now I tend to try to avoid the use of elective because what does that really mean? And so I tend to like to use the term uh, time sensitive procedures that we need to get our patients in. That may mean using a aerosol uh, developing source such as a high speed handpiece. 
Um, the mitigation there is obviously what we know right now is, uh, for instance, there may there are a variety of different um, vacuum systems that everyone is is looking at. Um, I'm, that's one of the projects I'm working with engineering right now to evaluate the um, I call them Hoover machines um, to see if they really um, work because there is no data there. Every company that I've talked with and we've ordered a couple of them to test at the school, they don't really have any performance data. Um, they just have right. manufacturing data, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they work or and so that's one of the things that we're looking at. We're also looking at, at least at the college, uh, changing uh, and adjusting the HVAC system, changing environmental controls uh, in the building. Um, and then we also built five negative pressure rooms, uh, which currently turned out to be uh, relatively straightforward to do. Uh, but I can't do, I personally can't do 350 operatories into a negative pressure suite. It, it just is cost prohibitive. But we are looking at different strategies and that's what it's going to take in the end is mitigating this. It's going to take a range of different creative engineering strategies and administrative strategies. How we, in our case, how we uh, triage the patient, how we verify uh, their health. Eventually, uh, we are working with UI Health uh, and the system here about the COVID testing. Um, are we going to get to a point such as was just introduced in um, one of the countries uh, in was a actually a driver's license to indicate, so to speak, your, your antibody status. Uh, although we don't know, even if you're antibody positive, if that is a protective titer or not. That's still an open question about the role of the passive immunity and time will tell uh, with that. Um, the other thing that we're uh, looking then through is uh, then, so we have, engineering controls, then we have administrative controls. Engineering is the most efficient and effective. Then there are administrative controls, such as how we're working and running our practices, how we're triaging our patients, how we're doing the standard informed consent, all of the things that were laid out very well in that ADA um, toolbox. And then last is PPE. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talk about getting a fitted N95 mask we talk about face shields, which is the two elements that are, are most, most important. We talk about the gowns, we talk about other types of equipment that we may need, but again, it's in, in the hierarchy of efficiency, the most efficient is that engineering control, then it's administrative, and last it's PPE. So it's, this, it's really important as we are thinking about our practices and the workflow of the practices, we need to look carefully at um, mitigating at each of those steps so and not just relying on a mask and a shield uh, because um, we have to be very careful and cogent about our patients um, and our staff and um, our fellow working colleagues and that becomes an issue especially when reputation of practices is going to be very important we need to make sure our patients feel comfortable returning to our practices feeling safe to be in our practices and being uh, and knowing that us as uh, some of the best dental care providers in the world, we continue to have their best interests in mind. That's, I think, one of the most important things on the other end of this little episode that we need to work at as a profession. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I was contacted by a, a patient of mine yesterday and she's a friend of mine and she wanted to know, you know, what was going on and when, when the office was reopening because she wanted to get in for an appointment and I explained to her that um, we would reopen as soon as I felt we had the necessary protocols in place and the necessary PPE. And she responded exactly what you touched upon. I trust you. I know that you would not do anything to put your patients in danger. And I, you know, I will wait until uh, she doesn't have any type of emergency situation going on. And um, she, she trusts that we would not reopen until we're ready to keep our patients safe and and every and our staffs and so i think what you said is is so true and vitally important that we have to make sure that we we do everything we can to have all the proper protocol in place uh, before 
we um, reopen our offices. And that might be different for, for each individual person. Um, I know what I, you know, what I am looking towards, what will be comfortable for me, that might not be comfortable for the next, next person. And the other thing that I just want to say is I think the testing, if we could sort of procure rapid tests so that we could test the patients before they um, come into the office, that would be of great help. And so I think we all have, um, we're all on the same page in terms of we all want what's best for our patients. And we all want what's best for our profession. It's just, um, it's a process right now as to what, what the answer is to that. It's you know? a stage landing of the airplane. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your day and spending uh, with me. Um, hopefully the members of the CDS um, are a little bit more enlightened by the great leadership. Um, you started off your um, year with a, uh, the concept of a kaleidoscope. Um, I have, uh, it's interesting, I don't know if you meant it, but <laughs> the kaleidoscope has become a, an interesting analogy about the way everything is spinning right now. Um, but again, I wanna thank you for your leadership and uh, congratulations again on being CDS president because we need your leadership at this critical time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you, Dean Stanford. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.